Good morning. Coming in from wet and cold Monterey Bay. Yeah, wet and cold. <laughs> but I'll take wet, it wet and, over the rest of this country. Wet and cold 50 degree weather when my friends in Nebraska are having to cancel church because it's 40 below wind chill factor. Oh, they did. But wow, that's no, brutal. Yeah, not all of them, but many of them. Just, wow, wow, wow. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's chilly other places of the country, they tell me, but... Hello to Jessica coming in on YouTube. Uh, it is probably kind of a slow morning for a lot of folks when the weather's bad. And I think pretty much everywhere the Monarchs family is represented, it is not the typical uh, normal. It's a little cold and chilly. So uh, everyone undoubtedly will be here soon. So hello to Bernie coming in on Facebook. The Wallace is on Facebook. Jeremy and family on Facebook. Twan, good morning on Facebook. Jenna on YouTube. Um, if our family, oh, well, you can only see Max and I. If we appear tired, we are. We have been at a, what, three or four day uh, speech and debate tournament Three. with uh, Jenna. She had her best tournament ever. I know some of you pray for her. Um, super proud of her. She worked hard and had a great, great weekend. But we are super tired. Well, and for <laughs> happy me, to be with the family of God today. And and obviously for many of us, I know Jeremy and Sarah Beth, Tuan. A lot uh, of travel. We did a lot of traveling uh, this week uh, so that we could go pay our respects and, and support to uh, Chris and Sue and uh, even to Rawl uh, with the loss of Nick. Uh, it was a, a privilege to be able to be a part of that funeral. Speaking of cold, that was uh, a, a chilly one. Yeah, and you know what? Um, I said this in prayer the other night, but when I saw that Jeremy and Tuan and Sarah Beth um, – opted to go as well and you know these things are you don't plan these things right. that you know it's last minute um and their friendship with chris and with the family has been one for probably more than a decade now i know for sure in some cases over a decade um and to see the monarch's family and friendships like that within the family to the point of like you know, especially in the case of Jeremy and Sarah Beth with four children, a large family, you have to be able to really, that's a lot of logistics to make things happen last minute. And Jeremy shared the video of when they surprised Chris, they didn't tell her that they were coming and her response to that. It was just, I, I was so warmed because I think about Jesus's command to us to love one another um, so that all will know that we're his disciples by the love we have for one another. And so, to me, it was such a beautiful demonstration of that verse and showing up for one another. Um, in We show up in the good, we show up in the bad. And to see them show up like that for her was just one of the most beautiful expressions of that verse and that command from Jesus. So, well done to the Monarchs community. Thank you. Agreed. And we'll definitely, let's remember, Sue, it's a, it's a tough one. Obviously, we want to pray for Chris yeah. as well. but. Uh, Chris's faith has really buoyed her immensely during yes. this, and we want to pray that that continues, but especially for Sue. Good morning to Dennis and to Dudley, and a belated happy birthday to one of the best human beings on the planet, Nona Vici. Yes. And I will also add that the Galimba family has another teenager in the house. Happy birthday to Logan, who turned 13 this past week as well. So, um... Lots of exciting things happening over here in the Monarchs family. Absolutely. Hello to Jaina. Good morning to you. So happy birthdays all around as well. So yeah, it is a, uh, you know, it's to us here. And I mean, I grew up in, in, in cold weather. So to me, it just seems sort of normal. Uh, yeah, it's, it's brutally cold. You have wind chill factors where it's like 30 below back east, especially in the Midwest. Uh, but what we tend to forget, and I never appreciated it as a kid, but that that type of cold snap, people actually die. Yes, that's <laughs> true. So I mean, it's it's not uh, it's not insignificant. And so let's pray for uh, those that are in parts of the country where you know the last thing they need is to lose power. Yeah. You know? Right. Right. Uh, and we also a lot of college students traveling back to uh, school this weekend. I know for Jessica's college, they return this week and I know that's common for a lot of universities and colleges across the country and um, even 
Jessica's flight has been changed. She's not going out till Tuesday now, but it's all weather related. So um, I'm not complaining. I get an extra day with her, but I think praying for all of those that are traveling and, and have to travel in right. it as well. So good morning to Kathleen. Good to see you. Hello, Jaden on YouTube. Welcome, welcome. So let's go ahead and pray and we'll jump into the word of God. Hey, Myrna. Hello, Myrna. God, we thank you for our time together, the opportunity to gather in your name. Thank you, Lord, for those that join from all over. We're so grateful, so appreciative to that. God, I pray that you would be with us as we study your word today. Help us, Lord, to be doers of your word and not just hearers. God, I pray for those that celebrated birthdays this week. God, that you would bless this year for them. Let it be their best year yet, a year that they look back on with great fondness and love and appreciation for all that you will do and accomplish for them this year. Lord, I pray for the Chavaria family. You would just continue to bring peace and comfort to them. Lord, for the rest of us, we kind of just move on with life. And for them, life is just stopped. And so, God, I just pray that you would meet them there in their grief and in their suffering right now, and you would be their greatest comfort. And I pray, God, that their hearts would be turned towards you um, as they look for comfort and they look for peace. And I pray, God, that you would make yourself real in a way that they have never experienced before. God, I just pray for all of those that are impacted by these cold, this cold snap and cold front that's really moved across most of the United States. I pray for those that um, need to have power that, that would die without it. I pray that you would keep their power on. Lord, I just pray for um, our country. It's a uh, I know that there are parts of the world that this type of cold is just kind of normal in the winter, but it's what we're experiencing is not completely normal, even in other parts of our country. So God, I just pray for um, especially your people, those that are a part of your kingdom. I pray, God, that you would keep your hand upon them. And Lord, I pray for all of those that will be traveling, that have to travel, not because it's just an optional thing, but because they have got to travel. I pray that you would keep your hand on them. Um, Lord, I pray for all of our pilots that are navigating planes in these uh, storms and in the ice and the snow and all of the airport workers and just that you would keep um, our country safe as we move about the next couple days with this cold front. Lord, we thank you for our time together with you and with one another. I pray that your presence would be felt in each one of our homes. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello mm -hmm. to Maria. Good morning. Hello to Martha. And Logan says, thank you. He had a memorable time with his rite of passage on Thursday. For those of you that don't know. He, he grew his first chest hair. No, Jeremy and Sarah Beth have a rite of passage. I wouldn't call it necessarily a ceremony, but it's a whole entire day where kind of like what you see in the Jew, uh, Jewish faith where bar there's mitzvah, the bar yeah. mitzvah. Um, and I know that Jaden had experienced that a couple of years ago, and I know that Logan was probably waiting for his turn. So I am confident, Jeremy and Sarah Beth, that you made it uh, memorable and special, and I'm glad that Logan um, had a great time. So Logan, welcome to your teenage years. All righty. Uh, we are in part two of a sort of a mini series before we jump back to Revelation called Influencers. Uh, last week we talked about really influencers on self and relationships, and it seemed fitting going into the new year. Uh, a lot of times you talk about a new year, and I've taught before about like working it backward. Like mm -hmm. how do we want to see ourselves at the end of 2024? And if we take that as sort of the picture we're we're wanting to paint, you know, God's will be done. Obviously, as as uh, you know, Chris and Sue found out sometimes. You know, you can't control some things, but right. for that which is in our control, a lot of it comes down to what we would call influence. Mm -hmm. And the whole concept of being an influencer is sort of a, a it's, it's relatively new in terms of the vernacular, uh, but it's not new in terms of the impact. And so today we're going to talk about influencing God and men, and you might say influencing all right. Logan, that's wonderful. For those of you on YouTube that can't see Jeremy's comment on Facebook, Logan also mentioned that he really wants to get baptized. <laughs> Make that happen. Absolutely. Um, you and like a double baptism, yeah, maybe. You've got another one coming up. 
And so when it comes to uh, today's topic, we're going to talk about influencing God and man. I do obviously have some questions, including a little video I'll show later. Uh, but you might say, wait a minute, influencing God? How do we influence God? Well, there's not a formula, okay? God is uh, a, a person, okay? And he's able to do what he wants, and we can't manipulate him. We can't hold his feet to the fire. But he does reveal in his word some of the ways in which he allows his people to influence him. Right. And so we're going to take a look at that today because I think going into 2024, uh, to know not only that you have the influence of God working through you to others, it's sort of good to be able to say, you know what, I might need to really know how to be able to influence God at times, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so we're going to talk about that today. Sounds exciting. So, influencers part two. Let's jump into some things, starting with a definition of influence. The capacity to have an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone or something, or the effect itself. Yes. Uh, again, I like that. The capacity to have an effect. Okay. On what? On the character, the development, the behavior of someone or something, mm -hmm. or the effect itself. We would say it was, you know, it was an influence and we were talking about the thing itself, not just the, the uh, outworking of it. So that having been said, I have one, two, three, four questions. Get ready for your trivia. Four questions. Here we go. So according to U.S. Department of Transportation, figures from 2021, an average of how many people per day were killed in car crashes, 100% of which were preventable, related to driving under the influence. Meaning drunk or high. So 7, 17, 27, or 37. So this is average per day killed in DUI crashes. And this is in... The United States. In the United States. And again, the 100% of which were preventable, that was not my editorializing. That was actually from the, the Department of Transportation website. Um, there are a few, you know, causes of death that you could say they're 100% preventable. This is actually one of them. Yeah. Um, well, you have a friend who was killed in an accident that truly was an accident. The woman driving had a stroke, right. went off the road. And your friend was changing a tire. Mm -hmm. And so that was truly an accident. I mean, it was one of those things that it was like, must have been God's time to call him. It was just so random. Time but and in chance this, happens to them all, according this, to Ecclesiastes. Yeah. So this is something that is 100% preventable. We have got answers coming in super fast here. Mm -hmm. And Sarah Beth is first on hey, Facebook. Vicky with the correct answer 37 so yeah uh this was 2021 figures i can't imagine 2022 or 2023 would have differed that much i don't have those figures 37 but on average per day per day that's a huge amount yeah. multiply that times 365 and, and unfortunately there are no doubt individuals that people. are part of the you know monarchs extended uh family here including those that have not given ECAM permission, and so you're not represented by the eyeball or, or, or comments, but we know you're there. Right. And we know that it's a it's a it's a painful subject mm -hmm. because everybody I mean, you've gotten blasted by a drunk driver, you and the girls, and, and you were uh, impacted with it as far as concussion. It's uh it's it's very troubling. Yeah. And it's one of those things where the point is not to be uh, overly condemning because if I'm you know going to be you know, brutally honest in my less than than uh, stellar pre-conversion days and so forth. Uh, you know, as a typical college student, young man, irresponsible and so forth, there are things you know regarding this that uh, thank God He protected others from me in mm -hmm. that regard. And I say that to and say yourself, yeah, and protected myself. yourself from yourself exactly. And I say all that to say if you know somebody that this is something where they push the envelope, uh, you know. Let them know that there there is an opportunity to sort of, you know, duck the problem before it's too late. And yeah, God can help. That's right. So. Hello, Anton, coming in on YouTube. Good morning, Anton. Next question. I still am th thinking about that. It's a staggering number. Hmm? I had no idea it was that high. So according to Michael Hart, who authored a book claiming to identify the top 100 most influential people in the history of the world, only four of the top 50 were individuals primarily associated with artistic expression. 
So painting, photography, music, literature. Mm -hmm. Which individual was not in the top 50? So as much as we want to say that artists, musicians, and so forth are so influential, actually, in this particular study, they were found out to be, as far as groups, sort of the least influential. So, But there were some that made the top 50. Which one did not? A, Michelangelo, B, Bach, C, Beethoven, or D, Shakespeare. Now, you look at that list and you think, well, probably all of them yes, should be seems, in that list. Seems like a Mount Rushmore, doesn't yes, it? Yes, yes. Um, and I do think that um, all of them were in the top 100. Okay. But only three of them were in the top 50. Wow. So That's interesting. Now, what he, you know, what his criteria were for determining uh, influence, you know, I, I've, not made, I've not made a study of it, but... Uh, I will take, you know, I will take his word for it with a grain of salt. But I do think that common sense for those of us who just know <laughs> culture would say that that's probably. You know what common. I, you know what I'm thinking of is, you know, there's the expression of being a starving artist. Mm -hmm. Historically, people thought of going into the arts as something you were not going to make money on. Which would sort of that idea, I mean, we tend to pay people based on influence and impact. Mm -hmm. And I guess that expression kind of reveals what he's showing here is that they didn't, they weren't considered that influential. I think if you were to take these types of polls based on maybe the last 50 years in the world, I think you're going to see a lot more artists in there and we pay them a lot more too well, because I, we value it more now. Well, is my point. I, I will go one step further. I think it's because we have crossed the threshold and it really started probably. I would say within the last 40, 50 years, where being famous yes. has become like the top virtue. Yeah. And it's not. No. It's not a virtue, which is one of the reasons why you see even a lot of these people that decide to go out on some shooting spree. It's like, well, I'm not going to be known for anything else, so I'm going to be known for this. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, that's, you need to set your sights a little higher. Right. Most people are getting it right. It, Jenna it was, Ant Bach. was first on YouTube and Vicky was first on Facebook. It was Bach. He was not. He's top on... 100, but he wasn't top 50. The other three were top 50. Interesting. So, second to last question. So, in a study published in Nature Human Be Human Behavior, the U means it was like a British study. Researchers found that people tend to have a maximum number of how many places that they visit regularly. Our girls cannot answer this because nope. they know this, you know right? It. That's right. And if they add a new place, they'll stop going to one of the others. This rule held even if they adjusted for the time people spent at each location. So think of where you go on vacation. Think of the restaurants you eat at, you know, stuff like that. Basically, according to this, the average person, person you got a maximum number and you got your places as a creature of habit mm -hmm. and if you add a new one you're going to drop one of the old ones so 15 20 25 or 30 places so what what's your what's your maximum number of places i find this so fascinating because i don't think anybody likes to really i mean some people don't mind being a creature of habit but i think most of us think that we're so much more diverse than what we actually are and so much more unpredictable than we actually are, which is why advertising and marketing is so successful because we are such predictive creatures. Well, and also let you know why so many billions of dollars are spent on trying to get you out of yes. one place and into a brand new one. That's exactly right. Um, yeah. Nobody has the correct answer yet. Everybody's coming on with 15 um, no, you got more than that. You get a little bit more than that. Now, you may not go to all of them equally, but they're your your spots. Your regular spots. Yeah. Does this include like where you run your errands, like grocery shopping, things like that? I, I'd or have to look. Where you get gas? I'd have to look and see. I mean, obviously gas, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, you're going to get gas wherever you can get gas. Well, but this is regularly. Visit regularly. My guess is it probably it would. It probably would. It huh? probably would apply. You know, you probably only go to certain stores. Mm-hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, you know, that's not to say that you wouldn't do like a one-off in an it's emergency. The, it's where you visit regularly. Yeah. You're, well, you're, think about the, this. Your, your well-worn paths are to this many places and we still don't have a right answer. No, and that. think about this. When you go somewhere out of town, how often do you try 
everywhere you go while you're out of town is some place you've never been. We typically also look for places that we know even when we're out of town. Mm -hmm. If you've got to run in somewhere, you know, you usually find, well, I'm going to find the Target, you know, if I need to pick up something or um, we grab a burger, you know, we're going to, is there an in and out Is there, you know, a Wendy's or whatever your favorite spot is. Even when you go out of town, you try to tend to look for them. Maria, you came in with Correct yep. Dancer. It's, it's 25. 25. And what's interesting to me is this. I think many of us have seen things, you know, maybe people we know, people that are members of family or friends or whatever, and they tend to like do certain things for vacation or they go certain places and we go, why in the world are they doing that when they could be doing this, you know, mm -hmm. or they're going over there, but they insist. Why on, do the Manleys go to the desert in yeah, the summer? Yeah. Why, why do they go visit the largest ball of twine in Oklahoma or whatever, instead yeah. of, you know, going to see yeah. this. And again, because, you know, somebody has to sort of break them out of that. They got to give up one of their 25 in order to do something new. So Sam's coming in saying he thinks that number seems high, but I think this is why it actually factors in like, your gas station that you go to, your grocery store you shop at, where do you go to the pharmacy? You know, kind of those, we have only so many places that we go to. And it's like the, the invisible hand of influence because of that. Habit. Maria said that she kind of counted hers quickly and mm -hmm. that she came up to somewhere around that number. Hello, Lona. Good morning. I bet it's super cold where she's at. And it's also not incidental. I won't have time to necessarily dig deep today on it. But the whole point of influence and habit mm -hmm. will go together. Yeah, for and sure. And that includes spiritually. Yeah. Last one. Okay, so last question. It's sort of interesting. I mean, I, I remember when we first talked about that, you, know, you had ran across that study a while ago, and we started counting up kind of, we're like, yeah, it is kind of true. Mm -hmm. So according to Mark Michael Hart, who authored a book claiming to identify the top 100 most influential people in the history of the world, which individual was not listed in the top five most influential of all time one jesus two muhammad three buddha four confucius or five darwin so four of these were in the top five interesting one of them was not interesting which one was not and uh interestingly enough if i remember his book number six was the apostle paul wow so, wow, which makes sense. You know, speaking of that 25, uh, you know, when you talk about creatures of habit and so forth, not only do you have spiritual obstacles, you know, sin habits and and uh, fears and all sorts of other things that keep people from God. Think of it, too. If somebody is going to go from complete unbelief or secularism to a commitment to church. What are they yes. going to give up? Yeah, so <laughs> they got to give something up on, on their 25. Hello to Lucretia. Pastor Lucretia Williams in the house today. You know, they started uh, their Saturday. Their Saturday Sundays on Saturday. Sundays on Saturday. So she's here with us today. Good to see you. And um, those of you that are in our prayer group, you will remember a couple years ago us praying for her. She had a double lung transplant. And so we just celebrate and always rejoice that uh, that was a, su a successful transplant. So Amen. welcome to the house today, Lucretia. Uh, those who said Darwin got it right. It, it is was, Darwin. Darwin was not uh, listed amongst the top five most influential of all time, uh, which is a good reminder because if you're in, you know, certain parts of Western civilization, you might think, oh, well, you know, and Nobody got it right. Religion. You, you gave know. the answer, but nobody got it right. Most no, people. No, were somebody saying, put Darwin. I thought. Oh, they right. typed it in. Lona. Yeah, yeah. yeah, she's correct. She got uh, it right. Anyone who downplays the importance of religion, okay, yeah. is either ignorant or arrogant, and yeah. I don't mean that ugly. It's just the truth, okay. Uh, you you would know very little of humanity, not just historically, but presently. Yeah. I mean that the the people say, oh well, religion's dying, Christianity's dying. Really? Have you looked at Africa? Have you looked at Asia? Right. Have you looked at Latin America? It's exploding. That's right. You know, there there may be individuals, you know, particularly if we can put it really, you know, bluntly in the quote unquote white Western world that it may seem like, oh, well, you know, it's just Darwin and religion's dying and all that. No, it isn't. No, it's not. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. And not only that, religion deals with ultimate issues. That's right. Specifically origins, meaning morality and destiny. 
whatever you do, whether it's secular or sacred, to plug in, okay, what explains, what best explains and most coherently ties together the best explanation of where we came from, of why are we here, mm -hmm. of, you know, how should we live and what will be our ultimate end? Guess what? You're religious. That's so right. we can chuck this whole spiritual but not religious nonsense that people like to spew because everybody is religious. It's yes. just a matter of which one they're picking. And oftentimes it might be some of, one of their own making, yeah. to which I would say, well, guess what? That's the claim of a prophet. So I guess you're going to start your own religion like these others, huh? No. It's one of those things where you realize I have to be able to, to, to bring this together. And even if I choose not to think about it, ah, la, 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 I don't want to think about it. Guess what? You have a choice. You're going to find out one way or another. That's right. That's so. right. Vicki says religion is a fundamental of civilization. Indeed. It is. All righty. It absolutely is. So we are continuing our series on influencers, our mini series on influencers, and we're going to deal with on spirituality and influencing God. I do have, I believe, uh, I you believe have a, I have video. A, a quick video clip that we're going to show here, but not before we take a look at are you wanting to start the clock Galatians. okay so if you're new with monarchs you know better hydrate then on the right side of the screen we have topics and categories uh, on spirituality is the actual start of Max's message today and you're going to see a clock drop down in the lower right corner of your screen it will count backwards Max only has so much time for each one of those uh, categories of his sermon much like you see the ESPN pardon the interruption so are you ready for the clock to start yep okay here we go on spirituality, let's start with Galatians 5. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Notice I called it on spirituality rather than on religion. Yeah. There are even quote-unquote religious people that like to bash religion. Because right. religion as a it has sort of a negative connotation like, oh, it's just telling me all the things I can't do. Right. And it's like, well, no, actually, we see that the foundation of Christianity is freedom. That's right. Okay. But it's not freedom to just say, hey, you want to sin with impunity? You want to be an idiot? You want to be a jerk? You're free. No, it is freedom from whatever your base influences are mm -hmm. and base nature is to actually do good right. and to do right. That's right. So true spirituality. Because people like to talk about spirituality, not religion. So I want to talk about influences on spirituality. It's rooted in the love of God, and it produces what? Freedom to do right. Right. Which means true spirituality is not going to be influencing you toward religious legalism. Right. Okay, so here are all the laws and rules you have to do, and if not, God's going to chuck you to hell. No, that's not true spirituality. Right. But neither is it religious lawlessness that says, hey, guess what? The grace of God. Here's your license to sin. Do whatever you want with it. No, it's a lot more uh, specific than that as we see in Galatians. And so we're going to go gal through Galatians 5 for a little bit. Now, here's your question. Multiple choice. This six-time Olympic sport was eliminated after the 1920 Games, but new efforts are now at work to get it reinstated. A, underwater swimming. Which means the whole length of the pool underwater. I was like, don't yeah. they go underwater? So it's, you're not You're, you're above not it breathing, yeah, yeah, above water. B, tug of war. C, croquet. Or D, standing long jump. So you're just standing still standing, and then you jump. Rather than running and, yeah. and jumping. Okay. So one of these was a six-time Olympic sport, okay? And it was eliminated, but now there are efforts to get it. What does six-time mean? It was six meaning times. Meaning there were six, six Olympiads. This was an official medal sport. You okay. could get a medal in it. Okay. Um, and so there are efforts now to get it reinstated. And so uh, when This it, is interesting. It is interesting. And you might say, what does this have to do with influencing and spirituality and so forth? Well... I'm going to show you here in a second. Rather than give the answer, I'm going to show the answer. Okay? Do we have that video? We have the video. Here we go. This is one of the long forgotten Olympic sports. Tug of war, a mainstay of the ancient Olympics and a part of old Egyptian, Indian and Chinese cultures. But it hasn't been in the modern games since 1920. Here at the World Championships in Sweden, teams from as far apart as Taiwan and South Africa are trying to shake off tug of war's image as a sport for village festivals and get it back into the Olympic Games. With 700 kilos of weight and untold muscle power on each end of the rope, the sport demands stamina and a very thick skin. 
The moment you walk on the field, you don't know if it's going to be a 30-second pull or a 38-minute pull. Your hands is under physical stress the whole time, so it, it makes calluses everywhere on your hands. So that's, that's, it's like a rock. And that's why a lot of people ask us, but why don't we use gloves? The gloves would like take the whole point of it away. <laughs> With less physical and less Olympian sports like golf now included, many here wonder what tug of war has to prove. The next Olympics will mark a hundred years since tug of war was last included in the games. It wants to make its comeback by 2024. To do that, it will need to pull in more spectators. Organizers have demanded that athletes get in peak condition to show off the sport, and there are new categories for youngsters and women. It's kind of like a men's sport, and you should be like grow, grow big, but it's not that. It's very much technique. This is the first year that women under 23 is competing in the World Championships, so it's very big. But can women and youth appeal drag another sport off the Olympic podium? So That's there you so have it. Interesting. There you have it. The answer is indeed tug of war. That is so um, interesting. Which again, I remember doing that in school and so forth. And so I you might say, it was an Olympic sport. What exactly does tug of war have to do with influencing uh, our spirituality? Let's keep reading Galatians five. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. Now, let me just anticipate something here. Somebody might say, well, I believe that, you know, I don't even think we have a, a sinful nature. I think we're basically good. We may do bad things, but we're basically good. That's somebody who's never had a child. Yes. You don't have to teach your children to do cruddy things. That's right. They are more than willing to be selfish little takers at everyone else's expense. Mm -hmm. Because whether we want to admit this or not, the reality is, is we are not basically good right. okay we actually have to train that that's right. we have to allow god in his common grace to influence mm -hmm. that and so our sinful nature is going to be in a tug of war so our most difficult battle in the quest for true spirituality is not necessarily external influence of the world around us nor of demons in the unseen realm I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not diminishing those, but I'm saying that the most persistent battle is inward. That's right. Okay, the inward tug of war, okay, in which God's Spirit, if we are indeed regenerated as followers of Jesus, uh, He respects our free will, so He lets us constantly pull mm -hmm. rather than just overwhelm us. Right. Uh, think of Jacob wrestling. Right. Uh, both are competing. The Spirit of God and our sinful nature are competing for ultimate influence on our lives, and the side that's winning is going to be evident by the results. Where's the flag? Is it going mm -hmm. this way or that way? The intentions aren't what's going to determine it. That's right. So why well, intend this? Well, great. What's the evidence? What are the right. results? That's right. Next verse. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, divisions, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Meaning it's not a complete list. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Pretty straightforward. And remember, there's a difference between a weak moment of sin yeah. and a life practice of sin. That's okay, right. and that seems to be what's in view here. Let's keep reading Galatians. Oh, you have oh, something. Wait. Oh, I have something. Yeah, like pathogens that make our physical bodies weak and sick and dying. These internal desires of our sinful nature are going to attack, sicken, and weaken true spirituality. Right. And they then distance us from the kingdom of God, which the kingdom of God is the authority of God. That's right. Anyway, let's read. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit here's, in our lives. Here's true spirituality. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, can you be a non-Christian and have some of these virtues? Yeah. Of course. But this is what the Spirit is to produce in us when He's influencing us. Right. There is no law against these things. 
Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. And again, this image of crucifixion demonstrates that our internal sinful desires are not going to go gently. Yes. Okay? They're not going to go quietly. They're going to go with excruciating self-denial at times, at least until we create a new habit. Okay? Okay. And you don't have to do it by yourself. It has to be empowered by God's Spirit. And interpreting our influencers, I call it like spirituality lab results, like blood work. Mm -hmm. Who or what is motivating or leading me to do this action, say these words, or think these thoughts right now? Is it God's Spirit or is it my sinful nature? Could it be neutral? Sure. But intellectual honesty demands I got to at least evaluate. Okay, why? What is is happening here? Last verse. All athletes are just disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. One of the scariest verses for any preacher, actually, but it refers to our spirituality, not physical exercise, right. but it gives exercise and, and the Olympic Games really as an example. Right, exactly. So let's talk about influencing God. If you want to influence God, this is not a formula you can plug or play, but it is learning from those who did influence God how we can do it. Right. But first, a multiple choice question. With which statement do you agree and why or why not? One, a parent should never be influenced by a child. Two, a boss should never be influenced by a subordinate. Or three, a teacher should never be influenced by a student. Hmm. Yeah, being a geography nerd, you know, I, I had to correct my second grade teacher on the capital of Wisconsin. You had to? I had to. You had to correct. I was compelled. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's like that. She said Milwaukee was the capital of Wisconsin, and I just humbly raised my hand and said, I'm sorry, I believe it's Madison. And she took it real well and, and so forth. There wasn't any ugliness. And she it, became a better teacher that day, Yeah, folks. she was allowed to be influenced by students. So yeah. I, I, I'm not sure what you think as far as the answer to this. Jenna says none. Uh, you know, to say a parent should never be influenced by a child or a boss should never be influenced by a subordinate. Well, you're just not living in the real world well, if that's the case. Yeah, like for instance, I have a friend when he became a, he was commissioned as a new officer army officer, second lieutenant, 22 years old, he said, I've got, you know, first sergeants that have been in the military as long as I've been alive. If I don't listen to their wisdom, I'm an idiot. Yeah. Um, Jeremy says none of the above. Maria yeah. says, I am not big on never. Exactly. I agree with that. And Lucretia says, I agree on none of. And this is why when you might say, well, why would God ever allow us to influence him? Mm-hmm. Maybe we see this. It's not a diminishment or a diminution of his authority. Right. So just because someone in authority seeks others' input, maybe even because they know what needs to be done, but mm. they want the other to you know, contribute. Yeah. Doesn't mean that every attempt of subordinates to influence their authorities will succeed or should succeed. Mm-hmm. Just because a child influences us once in a right manner doesn't mean they're going to get everything they want. Right. Okay. What parent says yes to a child's every whim? Right. A bad one. Okay. What business owners or military officers always cater to those working under them? Those that are not going to be in authority much longer. Right. Uh, what teachers abdicate their influence over the classroom to their students? You know, my second grade teacher didn't say, you know what? Max, you should come teach. You're now. the teacher. Yeah. I'll be a student. Yeah. Now. You know, confident and competent authorities can be influenced wisely and respectfully, but not manipulatively. That's right. And that's what I want to talk about. We can. Influence God as he allows, but we can't manipulate him. Right. But that having been said, a lot of people don't even try. Right. And so that's what I want to talk to you about as we go into 2024. Matthew 6, 10. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Should be a familiar passage to most people. And it's really key to influencing God because it's not my will, but thy will be done. Right. Okay. Right. So that having been said, God will prompt us to have faith and intimacy needed to influence him with our prayers, but he remains under no obligation to approve our every request. Right. You know, people will say, well, you know, I prayed and, and it didn't happen. Mm-hmm. Well, guess what? My kids have asked for a lot of things that didn't happen. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, there are a lot of things maybe I wanted to happen in a work context or some other context yeah. didn't happen. Um, and, and it didn't mean like I checked out on life or, or gave up on the system. Frustration in prayer can result 
uh, from our unsuccessfully trained to influence God to do our will. Right. Okay. To align our prayers with God's will, we actually need to know what God's will is rather than presume it. That's right. Okay. We we all have this tendency to presume it. Mm -hmm. But let's say, hey, I may want something, but is it aligning with what I think God would want as right. well? At right. least what I know he would want from his word. Right. So in order to see this, let's look at most of, one of the big God influencers of all the Bible, and it's Moses. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. We don't have a clue. Where did the guy go? Yeah, when God is silent or slow or seemingly absent, mm -hmm. we're always going to start to make something else our ultimate. That's right. Hey, this is what it's Maybe about. Maybe this is what God wants. Yeah, yeah this is what, That's gonna, what we start. We're, we're going to make it happen. Yeah. Uh, so let's let's see what God says to Moses when they start dancing around the golden calf naked. Then the Lord said to Moses, "Go down because your people, whom you brought up out of Egypt, have become corrupt." They have been good leadership, Moses. Way yeah. to influence them. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Great, great church culture, Moses. Way to lead them. Now leave me alone so that my <laughs> anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord, his God. Okay, here's a few questions. Uh, they can be rhetorical or you can answer. If God's ultimate intent, okay, was to judge Israel this severely, I'm going to wipe them out and start over with you, Moses. Why mention it? Right. Why not just have Moses go down, there's a bunch of dead bodies, and surprise, we're going to start over with you. Why utter the words, now leave me alone? Right. Yeah, hold me back. It's like an NBA fight. Um, if God just promised that Moses would be blessed, to become the new father of a new Israel, why would Moses have to seek God's favor? Didn't he already have it? And the key here is, what's God's intent? So many people slander God because they don't consider, what does he really intend here? Mm -hmm. Is his intent really to destroy all these people? No. If it were, why mention it? Why right. bother saying anything to Moses? You don't need his permission. Instead, he's desiring influence, and he wants to show him what that looks like. So let's keep reading Exodus 32. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people? Well, not my people. I didn't bring them out. Yeah. God said, no, these are your people. They're corrupt. You brought them out. No, God, I didn't. You did. Your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger, relent, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. Moses turned and went down the mountain with the two tables of the covenant law in his hands. He this was, blows my mind. He was, he was already influential. Now Moses he's Moses didn't time just influential. say, okay, God, whatever your will is. How about this? He also didn't get discouraged like, wow, I really am a failure. Yeah. Yeah. Or pride to say, yeah, wipe them out. Start over with <laughs> just me, God. Exactly. These people are idiots. Just yeah. get rid of them. Um, here, so let me give you four things, that, what I call the, in, the Moses way of influencing God. Okay. The Moses way of influencing God. Number one, practice God's presence. Yes. Okay. You got to spend unhurried time on the mountain if you want to influence God. That's okay. Right. This is a neglected key. There's no real way around it. Right. Okay. You want to influence God, practice his presence. Number two, prioritize God's reputation mm -hmm. rather than your own. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not in control of this God you are. That's okay, right. it may look like I have run this into the ground, but ultimately, this is your deal, not yeah. mine. Number three, ponder God's intent, especially in perplexing circumstances. Like, why would the Bible say this? Or why would right. this be happening? Rather than just give up or ignorantly slander God, just say, hey, you know what? I think there's more involved here. Yeah. Number four, pray God's word. Appeal to the authority of his will. Hey, wait a minute. Remember what you promised Abraham? Yeah. If you're not going to listen to me, at least listen to yourself. That's right. God's trying to get that out of him. Yeah. Exodus 33. 
As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. So the Moses way of influencing God that Joshua understood and followed after, okay, is yeah. this. Um, intimacy and intercession before influence. Yes. Okay. The Moses way of influencing God and Joshua got it. Intimacy and intercession before influence. Right. So if we have, do we have, are we, we going to take this to yeah, the next, to the after do. party? I'll just take it into next steps. Let's just take this into next steps. I've got a couple more scriptures and one more point. And so remember Joshua. He was like, you know what? Everyone was influenced by Moses. They see him doing his thing. Oh, wow. Let's, let's pay attention mm -hmm. to Moses here. But Joshua was the only one. I want to live where Moses lived in that place with God. That's right. And that's going to yield some results. Numbers 27. So the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit of leadership and lay your hand on him. At his command, he and the entire community of the Israelites will go out and at his command, they will come in. So Joshua is going to be the next great influencer right. of both God and men after Moses' departure here. And so... What does God say to Joshua after Moses dies? As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people. So the final thought actually is a great thought from Leonard Ravenhill. And this is not just church lady day spring, put it on the wall or a bumper <laughs> sticker of your car. This is absolutely true. So hear this. A man who is intimate with God will never be intimidated by men. So good. A man who is intimate with God will never be intimidated by men. And, and, and here's the thing. I'm telling you that this statement is outrageously accurate. Yes. Outrageously accurate. My level of being intimidated by others is directly proportional to the level of my intimacy with God. Mm -hmm. When I experience that intimidation factor, it's sort of like a warning light on my car that my intimacy level with God is lacking. Okay, it's time for 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 normal service. Well, it's really just that you become more concerned about the approval of man than the approval of God. The intimidation is really about what do they think of me? Mm -hmm. What you want to have a good opinion? You want them to have a good opinion of you. And remember, Moses went up the mountain. At, he comes down. He sees what they're doing. Breaks the commandments. You know, grinds the idol into powder. Has to go back up get some more. Uh, and when he comes back down from communing with God. He comes down and his face was glowing. Now, if you yeah. saw Charlton Heston, they sort of tried to make it happen. But the, the people were freaked out enough. They said, hey, Moses, why don't you put a veil on? Yeah. <laughs> You're yeah. sort of freaking us out here. Because when you are that intimate with God, you're going to freak people out. It's so true. Okay? And you know what? In a good way. Yeah. I've seen it happen. Again, this is in, in no way uh, meaning to be arrogant because I don't feel like I'm living in that realm. It's certainly not at this moment. But I know what it's like to live in that intimacy that when you sort of come down from the proverbial mountain you don't even have to say much and people mm -hmm. are like whoa you know something mm -hmm. something something's up here and uh yeah when i have avoided the mountain then i let people freak me out mm -hmm. um so and again the point is not to freak people out <laughs> the point is to say you know what i want to be able to have the influence on others that is sort of a conduit from heaven that's right rather than just you know, another voice mm -hmm. or another dude. I mean, when we come down from the mountain of intimacy, you think we're going to freak out about Trump or Biden in 2024? Mm -hmm. You think we're going to freak out about China or Iran or Russia or the interest rates or career opportunities or money problems? You think we're going to freak out over every internet troll that we see on social media or religious wacko that makes us look bad? Never. Because all of a sudden, the influence of the God who's never freaking out, who's right. never hitting the panic button, has consumed us because we've transcended. Right. We've hit that place of transcendence. And it's intimacy with God and intercession before God That's right. that leads to influence of God and men. That's right. And so, so with good. that, I want to pray. Father, I thank you for your people and for their hopefully hunger to be influenced by you, but to influence others for you. And I pray, God, that with this, uh, we would all, in our context, I realize that people are at different stages of life, 
and their time and their energy and their effort, depending on the stage in life, their mountaintop may look different than somebody else's mountaintop. That God, I pray in 2024 that we would realize, you know what? The key to influence is being influenced and we got to go up the mountain. I pray God that we would prioritize that, you know, to practice your presence. I pray God that you would help us when it comes to really uh, pondering your intent and to praying your word and to realizing, God, that there is more to influence than just being a marketer and being a, 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 an advertiser or being a loudmouth. But instead, I pray for that genuine, transcendent, transformational spiritual influence where we can come down, not with the intent to freak people out, but where there's a genuine flow of your spirit that is irresistible. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, we, for, you know, you could probably spend a whole afternoon just talking about that passage there in Exodus and, and kind of breaking it down. Um, I know Dudley's got a question for the after party related to it, so I'm glad we can unpack it a little bit more. But when you think about that and how God does let, and there's this is just one example. There are other examples in the scripture of where we see God letting men who can, he considers his friend into what he's going to do. I think of Abraham, Abraham. and... I'm, I'm, I might even hit that next week. Okay, <laughs> but I just, I, there are there are other examples. And this idea that he's this big man upstairs and whatever his will is, we are just you know, chess pieces on a big chessboard of life is not how God wants to interact with us. He wants to have relationship with us where he says, like, basically sit down, let me tell you what I'm thinking about doing kind of thing. And we get an opportunity to be a part of it. I That is a transformational uh, viewpoint in your relationship with, in your relationship with God. If, if you don't think of God that way, um, this is not like, Hey, we're, you know, God's my buddy, my bro. It's not, it, it's not that to that extreme, but there is this relationship that we get to have with God. And it's, it's a very, it, it changes the way you view God and the way you move through life. When you understand that he wants to be able to let you in on what he's doing and let you be a part of it. And I, I'm glad we get to unpack it a little bit in the after party because there's so much there, right there in that story of Moses uh, being up on the mountain. Well, and and here's something to remember too, in Islam, which means submission, you don't you don't influence Allah. <laughs> you can do everything right and still go to hell. It's just complete submission. You know, nothing. You realize that there was a guy named Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob instead has a wrestling match with this theophany or the the angel of the Lord, you know, mm -hmm. God come in angel form. And it's sort of like, uh, you know, when a parent wrestles with his, you know, child, you know who's going to win, mm -hmm. but you, you just, you know, you play around. You're letting him, you know, do some stuff. You're strengthening him. And what does he do? He says, I'm going to change your identity, okay? You're no longer this heel grabber, this, this deceiver. You are a prince with God. Why? Because you have struggled with God. Yeah. And men and have prevailed. The God of Israel, unlike the God of Islam, invites you to struggle with them. Yes. To wrestle with them. To wrestle with some of the things that you might find perplexing. And notice, even in that struggle, what happened? The angel of the Lord touches him, knocks his hip out of socket. Mm -hmm. You struggle with God, he may wound you. Mm -hmm. And and you know what though? That's the sort of thing where he said, you know, I'm I'm still going to I'm going to do that mm -hmm. because. You say, I, but I just want to know what God is like. Well, guess what? That's why he took a selfie. Yeah. And he became one of us. That's right. Okay. And he, he, you want to know what God is like? You look to Jesus. Yeah. Who himself said, you know what? I'm going to actually let you win this struggle against me, but it's for your sake. The the sin that you need, you know, that, that debt paid. I'm the only one with the resource to be able to pay it. Right. Okay. A finite number of human sins can only be paid by the infinite value that is in God. Yeah. That's why in Acts 20, it says that we have been purchased by the blood of God. And to realize that not only did he die for our sins, but then he was buried and rose again the third day, seen by over 500 eyewitnesses, you know, taught for 40 days, ascended into heaven, poured out his spirit. And guess what? He has influenced the world mm -hmm. more than anyone and it continues to to mm -hmm. this day. Right. And so when it comes to this influence, 
this struggle. I realize when it comes to matters of faith and spirituality, it is a struggle. But God invites you into it. It's not a, hey, check your brains at the door. Mm-hmm. Hey, you're not allowed to struggle with God. The That's God- actually a barrier to faith because people think, yeah. I have all these questions and they don't think they're allowed to. That God, If I submit to God, he's just, he's now, I'm just dancing to whatever he tells me to do. Well, and you know what? The nature of relationship and intimacy is if he's really your father, you're not going to want to tick him off. Yeah. You're not going to want to just defy him and do your own thing and so forth. But it's a relationship that, as we see revealed in Jesus, is love-based yes. rather than law-based. Yeah. So, Dudley, you've got a lot of comments. I want to take those to the after party because um, they're, they're going to be fun discussion. I'm excited about that. Okay. So, next steps next before we hit steps. the after party. So, uh, obviously, if you have questions, they are always welcome here at Monarchs. Um, and as you'll see in the comments, people actually have already put some in for our after party. But please... Feel free to put your com or your questions, your comments in. If it's something that's of a personal nature, you're not comfortable putting it out on a public feed, you can DM us those questions and we'll follow up with you. Um, if you just want to say out loud, you know what? I'm I'm following Jesus. I'm a friend of God. Go ahead and put the cross emoji in. Um, if you have something you need prayer for, please put that in the comments. We'll pray for you before we close out today. If it's something of a personal nature, you can DM us. Mm-hmm. And you can also, you've heard me mention it here today, we have a private Facebook prayer group that meets Tuesday nights for prayer at 714. But that prayer group is active all week long. So if you have something that comes up before Tuesday or after Tuesday and you want the the prayer group to pray, you can put that into the comments there in the Facebook group. And almost with immediately, within a couple minutes, somebody will respond and say, hey, I'm praying for you. So I uh, just want to encourage you, if you would like to join that group, you are welcome to do so. Jeremy, thank you for putting those links out there in the Facebook comments. Um, also, um, if you know baptism is your next steps, like Logan today said he was ready to be baptized. I know you have another baptism scheduled later this month, which mm-hmm. you'll be putting out those details mm-hmm. as well. Um, if you know that's your next step, please let us know. We will make that happen for you. Even if you do not live locally to us, mm-hmm. we can make that happen wherever you live. So just either put us a, a comment there in the a comment chat, or you can send us a DM and we'll follow up with you on that. Also, we have a online group on Facebook that is private, and that's where we put things throughout the week. Uh, Devotions sometimes are put in there, updates or whatever. If you haven't joined the online group, if you consider yourself a part of the Monarchs family, I want to encourage you to join that online group. It's private. Um, And at the top of that feed there in Facebook is a welcome video, and linked to that is a gift of Right Now Media, which is a Christian subscription-based streaming service on demand and we pay that subscription we do not see your viewing history but if there um if you just want to say 2024 i want to go a little bit deeper in my knowledge of god um activate your right now media account there are so many resources there for every or age and stage of you life. have family friends co-workers classmates whatever that maybe have questions and so forth do a but bible you, study through yeah, it you can you can Hey, let's watch a 15 minute video and talk about it. That's right. That's right. So, so many options there. And then if for all of you that are faithful with your giving, thank you. We do that at monarchs.church, which is our website. You can give online. You can set your gifts up recurring. And if you're uncomfortable with online giving, uh, our address is there for where you can mail your donation in. But just thank you to everyone that's faithful with that. We appreciate that. Thank you, Kathleen. And we will we will definitely be in prayer with ever. I will watch that for is. that, Kathleen. Thank you. And and just a reminder, I mean, I, I'm in the middle of this uh, mini-series. In years past, I actually have taken the Sunday of uh, Martin Luther King weekend, you know, in, in many cases to sort of springboard for some lessons that, uh, th- that uh, you know, can be taken uh, from you know, the life of uh, Martin Luther King, particularly his letters, letter from a Birmingham jail, yeah. which is you know really powerful. I encourage you to read that, and it's addressed to preachers, but it's right. it's good for everybody. Um, but one of the things when it comes to influence, people will say, "Well, you know, Christians are so judgmental; they just need to have their faith to themselves." Really? <laughs> what are we celebrating tomorrow? That's you know, right. That, why why is it a holiday? I mean. So basically, you're saying it's wrong to try and influence others to do right with the, their beliefs and behaviors. Mm-hmm. So I guess you're saying Martin Luther King was not a moral reformer, but he was a moral rebel, or what? I mean, 
when and it, he's when, famous for his I have a dream, which mm -hmm. is basically in the today's mindset. Well, you should just keep your dreams to yourself. Quit mm -hmm. trying to impose them on others. Yeah, I mean, it he was changed the world with it, that. You're you're you cannot have moral reform unless you're willing to acknowledge there's immorality that needs to be That's reformed. Right. That's right. And again, this is not a a, a, a sanctioning on uh, every jot and tittle of his life any more than he would sanction every jot and tittle of mine. The purpose is this, though, to realize that influence can be used for good. Yes. And we may not be able to do it on a societal level like that, uh, but we can do it on a, a micro level, if not a macro level. But we don't need to be intimidated or afraid as though somehow we're not being influenced by what? I mean, read a lot of his speeches and sermons and you're going to see a lot from Exodus. You're going to see a lot from Moses. You're going to yeah. see a lot from you know, the children of Israel and so forth and realizing, you know what, there is a a place for influencing a corrupt culture. That's right. And uh, and rather than be you know intimidated by it, realize, you know what, there's probably going to be some people that want to take some shots at you. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, you know, those that are the tip of the spear when it comes to saying, hey, look, society, you are not living up to God's ideals. You end up like John the Baptist mm -hmm. or you end up like Martin Luther King Jr. But it's still something that is merited because you realize, you know, influencing people for God and for good and for God's ideals is not wrong. Right. People may not like it. Right. Right. But it's still part of our mission That's and part right. of our Great Commission. So, And we should do it with grace. <laughs> Lord, I thank you for everyone who has carved out this part of their Sunday morning to really engage with you, your word, and your people. And I pray, God, that you would stir them uh, to love and good works. I pray, God, that you would stir all of us to really true spirituality and the influences that contribute to that. Uh, and most of all, our, our ability to struggle with you, but also to influence you as you invite according to your word and your will. In Jesus' yes. name, bless everyone in the monarch's family accordingly. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you need to be dismissed, have a great Sunday and a great week. For those of you that want to stick around, we are headed into the after party. and We have got some uh, comments here that we're going to work through. So, um Dudley said, I have thought a lot about the struggle between nature, your inborn drive or your DNA derived to survive, and nurture, your learned or spiritual necessity of mutual cooperation, etc. The Bible is so insightful in this universal tug of war that continues to influence the state and fate of humanity. Great points. I, I appreciate that, but I have to give credit to the Bible. Yeah. So Dudley's got a couple things here for the after party. So Moses influenced God. Does God have an internal tug of war as well? Moses spoke to God like a friend with advice. Interesting. You know, I I think that we do see things in Scripture where there's another one where, where I'm thinking well, every city's going to wipe everybody out. Yeah, and he relented of what he was going to do. Yeah. Whether or not that is indicative of an internal tug of war, um, I will say this: uh, the the theology of the mind of God is probably a deeper subject than I can just whip up off the top of my head to be able to, to do that justice, but it's probably a good study. So with your permission, I'll sort of, uh, you know, put that in the crock pot and let it simmer for a while. Um, but I will say that, that uh, more than likely when you see this Influencing and Moses is not the only one. You had mentioned no, Abraham. No, there's so many. If you look at the Old Testament prophets, most of their ministry was not foretelling the future. You know, it was going know, back and forth with God. Yeah, it was interceding for the people and then warning the people mm -hmm. and calling them out. And you know, a lot of times you might say, "Well, we talked. We just taught a whole series with Nineveh and Jonah. Yeah. That was another place where God was influenced." Exactly. Well, why does God? You know, God mm -hmm. knows everything why does he need us to pray in part it's because of the desire for intimacy yeah and it's the desire that's where he influences us going okay. back to edenic ideal thinking mm -hmm. of in genesis what did a, what did adam do every day he met with god every afternoon in the cool of the day right um i think it was afternoon i'm not Doesn't sure say. if it's clear it just says cool of the day i guess um but every day, and it's that's what God is wanting to have that type of relationship with us. Well, and that's the thing is when you spend time with God on the mountain, um, you know, th there is 
what happens afterward as well. I mean, you look at Moses and do do sort of a sort of a, a a study on his relationship with God. Like with most relationships, it's something that's built with time. Mm-hmm. You know, time and investment. Mm-hmm. Uh, he didn't start out this way. Uh, right. Okay, it gets to this point, and Moses speaking to God like a friend uh, is really part of the goal of intimacy. The word intimacy, I think a lot of times people think it has like sort of a romantic or, or connotation or whatever. It's not what we're talking about. Okay. We're talking about like an intimate family member, you know, parent, child relationship. The deepest parts a, of your heart and ideas and yeah, mind and all of that. A friendship. Who's, who, who's in the inner circle and so forth. Basically God's saying, you want me to be in the inner circle or not? Mm-hmm. Um, Dudley said, our, so our relationship with God is a dialogue other... back and forth. God's response takes uh, into account our own free will and self-determination. This implies that the future is not predetermined. This is a predestination question. Uh, we have influence in the outcome. I would say yes. I do think that there are certain things that God is going to, he's already declared it's going to happen. Okay. It's going to happen. How it happens, how it unfolds, some things are beyond our control. Other things are going to be, you know, operated within our control. And it, it takes me back to what uh, our one old friend mentioned he was a uh, uh, graduate of Stanford, you know, had his mm-hmm. PhD in applied physics. And he said, when it comes to this determinism, uh, is everything just sort of determined for you? He said, that's a huge topic in the physics department at Stanford. And uh, I said, mm, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't yeah. have thought that, but mm-hmm. I guess it makes sense because here's the deal. If there is no God, according to scientific secular humanism, that means literally all we are is chemicals, DNA, physics, whatever, which means there is no free will because free will is not a physical reality, Mm -hmm. you know, because they would posit all that exists is physical reality. So there's no soul. There's no free will. Everything you do is just predetermined by, by your DNA. Yeah, Richard Dawkins, the atheist uh, uh, zoologist, called it dancing to your DNA, which all of a sudden means literally there's nothing that you do is ever morally wrong. Mm-hmm. Now, it may be societally inconvenient, so we'll say it's morally wrong, we'll punish it, whatever, but... You, you couldn't help it. Right. It just was pre-programmed and, in you. And, and what you know Dawkins was basically saying is you can call a rapist or a child molester evil, but they're not. They're just dancing to their DNA. Is that that worldview you can really live <laughs> yeah. with and say, oh, yeah, that sounds like a great thing? Uh, no, it, it's 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 a morally bankrupt position. And it's it's one of those things where when people don't take into consideration, you know, this concept of free will and so forth, then why do we have a legal system? Mm-hmm. Why do we, why do we punish criminals? Why why doesn't everybody just go to the hospital and say, you know what, they they have some pathology in their brain or whatever. I mean, right. it may get to that day and that'll be really draconian. Yeah. But I remember uh, it was when, um, was it Scott Peterson who killed his wife yes. and dumped her in the San Francisco Bay and mm-hmm. he finally got, uh, you know, arrested and is serving life or whatever. And I said, you know, why not just get Richard Dawkins and a number of these other, you know, scientific naturalists to be expert witnesses at his appeal? Wait right. seven years. And then just say, Your He's Honor, a new creature. Your Honor, every cell in the body of the man who killed his wife ceases to exist. This is not him. So you need to let him go. Because cells reproduce. Yeah. It's a, whoever committed the murder is gone. Yeah. You know, because if there's no soul, if there's no free will, if he was just dancing to his DNA, well, guess what? The old, the guy who did it's dead anyway. You know, that's not the universe we live in. Right. Okay. And so when it comes to this, yeah. Does God, you know, invest us with free will and self-determination? Sure. Uh, does that mean that we can, you know, thwart his will? We can delay it. Uh, you know, well, we... you you taught the whole Nineveh series where we see God declares he's going to do something, mm-hmm. but you Their know, we response, have the, we, yeah. people's response determines really. And so... Does that they mean influenced God? There's a difference between predestination. It's just it's determined, predetermined. It's going to happen versus God has the knowledge of what was is going to happen, but not necessarily that He predetermined it all to happen that way. And this is an ongoing discussion we've had. Yeah, foreknowledge our, is not the same as predetermination. With our kids growing up, because there are many Christian circles that believe that everything is predestined, like you have no control over it. 
And so it could be even in a competition or something, if they were, they'd have friends that would lose or something. Well, it is, must have been God's will. Like I made a mistake and I didn't advance because that's not what God wanted for me. Yeah, the only... No, you just made a mistake. Yeah, I mean, the only possible exception to that would be, you know, it's obviously, you know, God hates Cleveland. Uh, the Browns are never going to win, and the Indians are never going to. Or excuse me, the Guardians or whatever. I'm kidding. God doesn't take favorites in you know in sports. I sorry, Bill, if you're yeah, listening. No, but it, it would it would I am sure many Cleveland fans feel that way. But no, it, it is one of those things where yes, the there there there's the sovereign will of God, and that cannot be changed. Right. But there's the permissive will of God. That the Bible teaches about where it's like, okay, I will allow this to happen. Mm -hmm. May not be my number one preference, but you know, I can allow it to happen. And that's where, yes, to have a a God who allows us to struggle yeah. and to identify and so forth. Again, that's why we worship the God of Israel, not the God of Islam. Mm -hmm. And so uh it, it, it's not to say that there's not a place for us to submit to him as, you know as a child does to a parent or whatever, there is. But realizing that he does invite us into the what Dudley called the dialogue because there is an intimacy with God of friendship that I think we see in the Edenic ideal that God wanted. Uh, we see with Moses, we see with others. Abraham is called the friend of God. So why would we not desire that? Well, and I think also going back to thinking of God in um, as our father, and that parent-child relationship where we can have influence on our parents as children, but for the most part, they're still making the calls and they're deciding what we're going to do. And we we actually look down on families that are child-led. And so I think if you look at just that relationship that parents and children have, that's much like how it is with, with God. I mean, he's... he's we don't get to just, in, just because we have some influence with God doesn't mean we influence everything that God does, is, is what I'm trying to say. And, and, that was, and you can see that in the relationship like of a parent-child. Right. And that was, uh, you know, echoing our message today. Yeah. So, so uh, let's see. Dudley said, how aggressive should we be in our efforts to be influential in human affairs? I think about the qualities of influence for which there is no law. Uh, well, here's here's my initial answer. I don't know. I mean, I think about the story with Moses there. You know, he gets into it and struggles with God. Why didn't he just be like, okay, well, this is what's going to happen with them. They did this. This is the result. Well, remember, God specifically called him burn, the burning bush experience. Mm -hmm. um, Have a good day, Martha. Enjoy your family. Uh, the burning bush experience, what got to it was not just God revealing himself to Moses and transforming Moses, but then he gave Moses a mission. Mm -hmm. And it was to be influential in human affairs. Right. Go to Pharaoh. Yeah. <laughs> and say this, okay? Uh, I do think there are times when God will raise up people to be influential in human affairs. Uh, in some cases, they may understand that that's what's happening in other cases we may not know until we look back on history mm -hmm. and say you know what god raised them up for such a time as this mm -hmm. you know esther in in the book of esther and so forth where there can be aggressive efforts to be influential in human affairs but i do think that it's something that absolutely has to be guided by the spirit of god and the word of god mm -hmm. uh, and in that regard there's no shortage of people who want to, you know, lead a movement. Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons why in the New Testament you read about uh, Gamaliel, you know, calming down the Sanhedrin because these apostles, they're turning the world upside down. You know, in the name of Jesus and resurrection. He said, you guys calm down. He said, there's always been people wanting to, you know, change the world and claim some messianic influence or whatever. And you know what? Everyone we've seen, they end up coming to nothing, mm -hmm. you know. But he goes on to say, if if this thing is not of God, it's going to come to nothing. But if it's of God, you're going to end up fighting against God, and you don't want to do that. Right. Which was very wise. Okay. There are some things in terms of you know how influential should we be in our human affairs. Uh, part of it is to also measure 
honestly, how influential really am I? Mm -hmm. Because what I see, I think it's, it's, all of us feel this way from time to time, but I especially see it in the younger we are. I'll just put it that way. The younger we are. We want to influence the world more we want, more than we want to change ourselves. Yeah, that's so true. And it's like, well, you know, you want to influence the world. What is going on with you? Yeah. And which is, we're back to the whole intimacy with God. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm intimate with God, what's happening? He's transforming me. Mm -hmm. He's influencing me. And now all of a sudden, rather than it wanting me to be out there and say, okay, everybody needs to change, before I ever get to that point, now I'm interceding for them. Yeah. Now I'm saying, God, you know what? There could be some really cruddy people, like people dancing around the golden calf. Mm -hmm. But God, I don't want you to kill them. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to wipe them out. I want them to, to experience similar change. So a lot of times the most influential people that God will raise up are going to be the ones that are intimate, and intercessors before they're out there as public influencers. Right. And if if there's somebody out there who claims to be a Christian influencer, but they're not really investing time on the mountain as in, intimate with God, and their intercession is an afterthought, then my guess is that their influence on human affairs is going to be nil, and they should probably go back to those other steps before they try to jump ahead to step three. Yeah, yeah. Um, Think about qualities of influence for which there is no law. Again, um, back to Galatians 5. You know, mm -hmm. these things, those will influence people. You know, people desire that. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know if that answered your question, but it's just sort of thoughts. So uh, Dudley just says, interesting comment about physics and free will. There has to be some sentience and moral influence in the mechanics of physical science. Yeah, I don't uh, know how exactly God has designed it um, because there's, I think it's evident that there is something regarding your brain that, that is, you know, genuinely physical. You know, if you have a traumatic brain injury, it's going to impact things. Dr. J.P. Moreland put it this way, and he may have modified his position on this. And it was an analogy, and all analogies about God break down eventually, but he, he basically saw it like this, that, you know, our soul, our immaterial being, soul, spirit, whatever you want to call it, is very real. And it's not the same as our physical body. Well, guess what? Our brain is physical. It's a physical reality. And there seems to be some interplay. And he said, the, the best analogy I can come up with is almost like a brain is, is akin to a car or a minivan or SUV or whatever where the soul is more like the driver of the car or the minivan or whatever. And there is an interplay, you know, that is evident. But whether it's through injury, accident, illness, whatever, your car can get broken. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a broken car as the driver, you, you know, you, sometimes you need an alignment. It keeps pulling this way or, or in some cases it just breaks down. That's where we can say, you know, if somebody's so severely mentally ill or has suffered brain damage and it seems to have changed them or whatever, is that the same as their soul? I think Dr. Moreland would say no. Um, basically, they're, they're in a broken car mm -hmm. at this point. Now, again, do I think that's a good analogy? Well, yeah, if, I wouldn't have shared it if I thought it was bad. <laughs> but, um, you know, do I think it's perfect? You know, I don't know. But I do think that when it comes to, like, moral influence – and, and sentience as, as far as our physical, you know, brain and so forth, there is going to be this sort of interplay between the soul and the brain. Mm -hmm. um, what all that, to what all degree that is, I think we have to wait to the University of Heaven uh, grad school uh, to really see it all. Um, but I do think that, you know, you can't just boil it down to physics. Right. Um, and that, I don't think anybody could live in that world. Or would want to. Right. And again, I don't want to embarrass anybody, so I'm not going to mention any names, but there's an individual that um, you know, I'm friendly with whose who's, you know, career and life has been in studying science and physics and so forth. And basically admitted, you know, we know that about 30% of what we claim is truth in terms of science and physics, we can't really explain. We don't know. It's often as much blind faith as what you that are religious you know, claim it's just such a fascinating thing. Alrighty. Short of any other questions, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Um, 
always always enjoy the uh, the engagement. It, always, it, it's part of what makes this a unique format, and uh, and hopefully. Uh, you're able to then go share it with others. And go be influencers. Influencers <laughs> for God. Spend time on the mountain, spend time interceding, and then come down and glow. That's exactly right. All right, everyone, have a great week. Thank you for being with us today. We will see you around online. Prayer Tuesday night at 714. And if you haven't done so, join that online group or the Facebook um, online group as well. All right, everyone, have a great day.